If you would join me in a brief word of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For God, you are my strength and my redeemer. If it is not on my manuscript, I ask that you place it in my mouth so that these your people are able to hear a word from you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This morning's sermon, if I had to attach a title to it, are Dispatches from the Front Lines. With the subtitle, And the Truth Shall Set You Free. Quote, whoever knowingly and willfully obstructs or retards the passage of the mail or any carrier or conveyance carrying the mail shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than six months or both. This is from Title 18, Chapter 83, Section 1701 of the U.S. House Code Concerning Postal Service. This was passed if I read it correctly, originally passed in 1948 and has, made, and, has had, and has been updated with some revisions. This, the short version of this oft quoted, uh, of, this, of this law that we all know, is a famous movie quote. We all know it's illegal to open somebody else's mail. And my friend, Jeremy Williams, he's a visiting New Testament scholar, professor at Vanderbilt University, likes to remind me that when we read the epistles, that we are reading somebody else's mail. <laughs> Paul's letter to Philemon concerning the runaway slave Onesimus, whom Paul sends back to slavery, is considered the only true personal letter from one person to another person, one-to-one, -one, that made it into the New Testament canon. However, it is clear reading Paul's letter to the church at Rome or the combined epistles to the church at Corinth or Ephesus. Many of these letters, perhaps having a personal, you know, tone in nature from Paul, but, but many of these letters functioned as missives to be read aloud in front of the gathered community, or at least sent with the idea that more than one person was going to at least read them. The general epistles such as Jude or James or First and Second Peter or Hebrews with authorship unknown, make itself evident that these were instruction guides for the burgeoning communities of faith who were facing a myriad of challenges. Now, most of us, we are familiar with, in some regards with the first Johannine epistle. First John chapter four has a well-known passage about love, echoing the sentiments of the gospel of John. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Verse 19 picks up, we love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, but hate their siblings are liars. For those who do not love a sibling whom they have seen, how can they love God whom they have not seen? But 2 John and 3 John, not many of us are familiar Again, these are not texts that were taught in Sunday school. In today's scripture that was read for us this morning, the entirety of 3 John is the shortest book in the Bible. 15 verses were read this morning and maybe even 14 depending on your translation. And it's so short that it reads like a personal letter and it, because it contains the telltale signs of a Greco-Roman letter with an introduction and a conclusion and a signature. And this letter is addressed to the presbyter, from which we get the word Presbyterian, presbyteros, the elder of the church. Which church? Nobody knows. Where was this church? Nobody knows that either. Perhaps somewhere in Ephesus. But what has been ascertained is that this letter was written close enough around the same time as the Gospel of John was circulating in the latter part of the first century, around 90 CE, give or take a few years. However, some scholars have placed it as early as 60 to 65 CE because it was one of the earliest circulating documents from the New Testament. And it is one without major discrepancies or textual variance. And from the content, it is clear 
that this was written as a word of encouragement to a newly formed community of faith that was on the front lines of a religious and spiritual movement and one that would alter the course of history. In the same way that the Gospel of John reinforces the notion of truth, this Johannine epistle follows the same tradition. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. And later, Jesus' crucifixion hangs on the philosophical musings and rhetoric of Pontius Pilate, who asks the simple interrogation, what is truth? Right before handing Barabbas over to the crowd, ultimately condemning Jesus to a death on the cross. The word aletheia is the Greek word for truth. It appears over 100 times throughout the New Testament. And six of those times is within these 14 or 15 verses that comprise the third Johannine epistle. To the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, testify to, the faithful, testify to your faithfulness to the truth, how you walk in the truth. And in this short letter, the overarching theme is that the author is encouraging this church toward the spiritual obligation for hospitality and welcome, and how the truth intertwines with that. Truth in the moral sense, it's a funny notion. Pontius Pilate's question from antiquity still haunts us to this day. In a world with alternative facts and fake news and with deep fakes and AI, this question of what is truth seems to have finally slipped the chains of objectivity and reached the bottom of the slippery slope of relativity. Theologically, the ideas of truth are connected to the divine. What God says is truth, a way of life, a way of behaving, a way of thinking, a way of being in the world that is correctly aligned with God. This sense of a moral good has been addressed by the great thinkers of humanity in every civilization. So the question is far from novel, but the author of this morning's text, like many others, intersects the idea of truth and what may be perceived as radical hospitality for this first century community of faith and commends them for making such a connection. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on in a manner worthy of God, for they began their journey for the sake of Christ, accepting no support from non-believers. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we may become co-workers with the truth. Now, let me pause here before I unpack co-workers with the truth to make an exegetical point. Third John is the only book in which the words Jesus nor Christ make an appearance in the original Greek. So even though verse 7 in English includes the word Christ when we read it in our translation. It is not present in the Greek. Rather, the Greek word onomatos, which translates as the name. There's a few theories about when this text was originally written. Perhaps I can offer my own. Maybe, just maybe, as a fledgling community that was attempting to fly under the radar of the Roman government and simultaneously grow its numbers, Maybe it did not want to get caught sending messages that could have resulted in their further persecution. It would make sense to not have a paper trail connecting them to the political dissident Jesus of Nazareth, who reportedly had thumbed his nose at the government so strongly that on the third day after his execution, he got up from the grave. And there's precedent for the use of the word name of onomatos, our father and mother who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Peter says to the beggar at the temple in Acts 3, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. The disciples cast out demons 
by calling on this name. It is at the name of Jesus that people have received healing, have received deliverance, have received recovery. And arguably, it is in this name that radical hospitality towards strangers produces the possibility of being co-workers with the truth. This imperative to be co-workers with the truth is, in fact, a conspiratorial effort. And it's a conspiratorial effort that arises from being on the front lines. Now, there are some in this church who might be here in person, who might be joining us online, uh, who have been members here longer than I've been alive. And I've yet to hear all of the stories of what it meant to be a member here 40 or 50 years ago. And then there are some who have joined 40 years ago, some who have joined 30, some who have joined 20, 10, some even just five, some maybe even just last year. And I gathered that for all of those who've joined, that you too wanted to be co-workers, co-conspirators with the truth. Church of the Covenant in recent decades and in recent memory has been a church that has been on the front lines for many causes, travelers and sojourners on a journey for the sake of the name, Jesus the Christ. Being on the front line for queer folks is certainly one story that I've heard more than once here at Covenant. Taking a stand, writing the language that was later used by the UCC denomination for open and affirming churches knowing what it means to hang a pride flag outside of the church, what it meant to publicly post signs and banners about George Floyd in the year 2020, to clearly state where we as a church stand on the issues of reproductive rights or climate justice. And sure, one could say because we're a downtown church uh, in one of the most liberal states in the country and in a progressive city, that maybe it doesn't amount to much. But the reality is there is still a risk that we take being out on the front lines when social issues intersect with our theological and our faith convictions. So presumably, the receivers of this third Johannine letter were struggling to figure out what it meant to be an open, progressive community of faith. What it meant to be welcoming and what it meant to be a welcoming and hospitable church in a culture that didn't value the things that they valued. This text, this letter from an ancient Christian community, I believe teaches us at least three things that arise when you become conspirators with the truth, when you become co-workers with the truth. Being on the front lines of a culture war can result in narrative shifts, especially ones that peddle in outright lies. I remember growing up that it was impolite to call someone a liar or to say you lie. I actually got in trouble if I actually used the word lie or called somebody a liar. But anyone who's paid attention to politics in the last 15 years or so, we have seen how the facade of civility and politeness have been eroded. A congressman interrupted President Obama during a speech to the joint session of Congress with those two words, you lie. And another former president has built a campaign predicated on promoting a lie about the 2020 elections. But even beyond that, this this notion of falsehoods promoted in culture have been foundational about the myths that this country tells about itself since its inception. Enslaved Africans were not worthy of personhood, personhood, only three-fifths, and Native Americans didn't count at all. The basis of the lost cause an effort to erase the fact that the South lost the Civil War, resulted in Confederate statues being erected around this country in the late 19th century. I want you to pause and think about that for a second. In what modern or even perhaps what ancient civilization have the losers of a war had the privilege to erect statues for being on the losing side? This led to grossly inaccurate narratives that the southern states seceded from the Union over economic issues, despite the written declarations that we have access to that clearly state the primary reason was to ensure the legality of slavery. So one of the first things that I think this text teaches us is that truthful confrontations are sometimes necessary. Truthful confrontations are sometimes necessary. 
with discernment sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, you need to call the other side out, name them, correct the record. This letter does not mince words about the dear brother Diotrephes here. He's been going around leveling false charges against this church. In other words, he's going around lying on them. One of the challenges that we as progressive Christians face is the fact that sometimes we don't want to offend. We don't want to call out others by name because we actually know what it's like to be targeted. But this text, I believe, is showing us that when times are dire, we sometimes need not shirk away from what we know to be true and name a thing a thing. I remember one instance while teaching a preaching course at my seminary, a student took a theological stance that I personally, I disagreed with. But this in and of itself is not a problem. There are many, um, there are many different theological ideas that I disagree with, but it was a perfectly fine sermon. Moreover, our faith is built on competing voices. But the theological stance was one that was not just disempowering to the women in the classroom, but it was just also offensive and insulting. So I made the decision to be a coworker with the truth and speak up. I called the student out on it, and there was a shouting match. It actually got pretty ugly. And even over one year later, I'm not even sure if the student fully recognized where they had erred in their sight of their fellow classmates. But it was a decision in which I went to sleep comfortably that night because of my moral and ethical traditions that called me to be truthful. Now, while the student in, in my class does not rise to the level of diatrophies, for in fact, I would give credit. This was a student, someone who had heard the call and decided to go to seminary for the sake of education. Diatrophies is what we in modern times would call a bad actor, a bad faith actor. He's someone who's making a bad name for all Christians. Not only is Diotrephe slandering the church, but he's refusing hospitality to the followers of the way and trying to stop others from welcoming the new converts, going so far as to actually kick folk out. Diotrephe is the one masquerading as a friend, but is set on undermining the movement. Diotrephe is the one who says, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Diotrephes is the one who believes God has ordained and predestined winners of elections, and to lose an election would result in the end of the world as we know it. Friends, we, we won't get free if we hesitate to tell the truth about the diatrophies of our world. Our failure to speak the truth, be it out of fear and the possible consequences that come with it, that is when we have done a disservice to our fellow co-workers in the truth, and perhaps we've even let God down. And if we travel on this road like our ancestors of the faith, we do so in the name of Christ. And God help us if we don't do our level best. Secondly, I believe this text teaches us to focus on what's true and to put our energy there. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. What is truth? What is, what is evil? What what is good. I, I do not have enough time in this sermon or any sermon to adequately negotiate those very weighty questions. Go look up St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas if you want a more involved answer than what I can give this morning. But as progressive Christians, we need to recognize that we, can, we actually cannot be all things to all people despite Paul's admonition. Or to put it another way, we need to be discerning enough to recognize that sometimes our 100% might not be good enough. But if that is the best that we have to give, then give it all and trust that God will provide the increase. Do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. That which is good is where we should place our focus, pour our energy and resources into that. And I believe that we begin to imitate evil when we succumb to the capitalist and imperial temptations of the world around us. Paul reminds us to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in Christ Jesus. Thirdly and finally, I believe this text teaches us that truthful 
community happens face to face. The author of this text concludes this letter with a bit of a cliffhanger. I have much to write to you, but I would rather not write to you with pen and ink. Instead, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk together face to face. I, I know that for a lot of us, coming into church can actually be a hassle. Coming in person, at least, can be a hassle. As I said, we're a downtown church without a parking lot, and during the summer, there's less parking because of open Newbury. And we have many who join us who don't even live in the same area code or the same state, but through the miracle of technology, we're actually able to see your face. This means something. When we know that we're not alone, it strengthens our fortitude to get up and face tomorrow. When we know that we're not the only ones who see the world the way that we do, that gives us enough courage to speak the truth so that we ourselves may be freed and that shining our light will also free others in the process. When I can see you face to face, I know and you know and we know that we're in this all together. For Jesus told us that when two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst. So despite the U.S. penal code for postal service, we do get to read someone else's mail that's almost 2,000 years old. And we are reminded that the ancestors of our faith were not the first ones on the front lines. As members of a progressive church practicing a progressive faith, a faith that intentionally marries the spiritual with the social to forge a practical theology, we ought to remember that we won't be the last ones on the front lines of faith. The emerging followers of Jesus in the first century recognized a need to draw a line in the sand, something that, that many of us are slow to do because of how fractured we already are as a society. And I get it. But one of the most damning indictments that was leveled during the Civil Rights Movement came from Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail that called out white clergy for their neutrality. Not so much that they were on the wrong side, but for just being neutral. And in a later speech in 1968, King was quoted as saying, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? And vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the right question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but they must do it because conscience tells them it is right. Friends, later in this service, when we gather for communion, let us be reminded that Jesus and his fellow co-workers, his fellow co-conspirators, were a beloved community, a truthful community that were travelers down the way of truth, seeking a better world than what they had inherited. They gathered in an upper room to share a meal and commemorate the inevitability of Jesus' sacrifice. These many year later, I invite you to join me, to join us, to join this church on the front lines. Join us as we welcome the stranger. Join us as we call out the stumbling blocks in our way. Join us as we imitate that which is good, and to do so in the strong name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the path of goodness. This is the path of light and life. This is the path of justice and righteousness. This is the path that follows Jesus, a path where goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life. Join me on the path so that you know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. <laughs>